Okay, as I'm writing this part script, my final episode of my Genshin Impact playthrough has more than 300 views. That's crazy, man. Getting 300 views on a 42 minute video with a channel with under 500 subs, and not to mention after my two year off of YouTube? I can't thank you guys enough. Also, that bit there was written around when I was finished with part 2 script, and now part 2 has over 800 views and I'm scared. <laughs> it's actually crazy to think that so many people enjoyed the feedback videos and I really do appreciate the support. So thank you. Also, also, September 9th is my birthday. So yeah, that explains why I waited to upload this until today. But going back to the topic... In the last two parts, we discussed about the world and the gameplay of the game. I recommend watching both part 1 and 2 before watching this one, because chances are I've discussed most of the mechanics that will be shown here. So if you missed the two previous parts, I'll put a card on screen to those two videos right now. But without further ado, welcome to the third and final part of my take on the final closed beta. Let's start with something light. Okay, who am I kidding? It's one of the things that makes this game different with Um, Child. Okay, well, anyway, it's both good and bad in its own rights. But since this game heavily relies on gacha to help with progression, I'd say it's the latter. Now don't get me wrong, most people just don't like gacha games because they just don't have the luck. If we all have 100 luck in every gacha game, people wouldn't hate on these games. Also, the game would probably die from bankruptcy, so... Anyway, from here on out, I will refer to the gacha as per the game's description, and that is Wish. The system works similarly like any other gacha game would. You'd have the option to single pull, which means to, well, only try your luck with one pull for one equipment or character, or to pull 10 times to get 10 equipments or characters. In some other games, you'd be able to get 10 plus 1 every time you do a 10 times pull, but so far there wasn't any option for that. I really do love the fact that they made it similar with what they did in Honkai. The currency that we need in order to pull for wishes aren't that hard to get. Wish events are pretty frequent, and chances are also very similar with what Honkai has to offer. Or so I thought. Throughout the final closed beta, there was one permanent wish, one early or new game wish, and also one event wish. Now, I didn't find any footage of the rates from my playthrough, but the wiki says that these are the rates for the promotional weapon and character wishes. The pity rate there basically means if you don't get a 4 or 5 star weapon or character after a certain amount of pulls, the next pull right after will be guaranteed a 4 or 5 star. And now Honkai's got your rate. I honestly didn't think it would be this different. It felt as though I always got something whenever I pulled from the wish. Although granted, it's whenever I pull 10 times, but I still did get a few good weapons and characters. The event wishes that were in the beta had certain promoted characters and equipments. If you don't play a lot of gacha games, this means that you have a higher chance to get the featured equipment and or characters. What I got in the beta was Sparkling Steps, which features Klee as the featured character, and also the Epitome Invocation, which features 5 star and 4 star weapons. If you manage to get the same weapon that you've already gotten from a previous wish or quest, well, CONGRATULATIONS! You're like 90% of the people who can't get anything they want in these games because you're that unlucky. But for real though, duplicate weapons give you 15 Masterless Stardusts, which you can use in the shop later on to buy something with it, if you choose to do so. With duplicate characters, like I've said in part 2, you get the very rare material, which is Stella Fortuna, for upgrading your constellation and also Star Glitter, which you can also use to buy characters that are available at the time of the shop, rare 4 star weapons, or intertwined fates and acquaint fates. I should have mentioned this earlier, but those two fates are the main currencies for wishing in this game. You can obtain them by using Primo Gems which you can earn through a variety of means including quest rewards, commissions, and even chests. Speaking of Primo Gems, the beta didn't really have any monetizations for Primo Gems and the Battle Pass, but since the game will be free to play, there will definitely be monetizations to buy them with real money. And you guys can definitely bet on me buying the BP on day one. Honestly, there's really not much else I can say about the wish that was in the beta since, I mean, I got three Noels, but hey, I wish you guys the best of luck so you won't get trolled by Mihoyo in the full release. This time around, MiHoYo definitely took a massive W for what they're doing with the co-op for this game. When Honkai was announced that the game will also be available on PC, the community was overjoyed because of the possibility to have better graphics, a more stable FPS, and also a better overall experience. A company who made mobile games for the last 4 years made a co-op for 4 massive platforms. Not only that it's on mobile and PC, it's also on PS4 and Nintendo Switch. 
Just imagine playing with three of your friends together on four different platforms. You're on PC, one's on PS4, another one is on their Switch, and the last one's on mobile somewhere on the road. How sick is that? Even though, well, that last part probably isn't that practical because of the connection, but more on that later. Before we get into the co-op in Genshin, I need to address a few things about the co-op in Honkai. First, unlocking co-op in Honkai was just as easy as picking an apple from a tree. You just need to hit rank 30-ish, and that's pretty much it. When you make a room or search for a game, you'll get put into a lobby where you can change which Valkyrie you want to use, change your weapons or stigmatas, you can see what you'll be going up against in that stage by clicking on this here, and you can also see the team's leader bonus from here. Pro tip, before you press ready to play, go into the chat and be a good lad and say hi to your team. Even if no one else says it, just do it. Nike. The thing that I liked about the co-op here is, like I mentioned in part 2 of how do you play the game, you don't need to switch characters but rather trigger QTEs with your teammates. It's actually very satisfying if you have a team where all three of you can constantly trigger each other's QTE. When you've completed the stage, you'll be met with the MVP screen, where it shows you who was the one that got the highest score. And the thing that I dislike is usually the MVP is the one who has better gear or is a higher level than you, if you're still below level 80. Now I saved this for last, and that is you can actually see your ping bar next to your name while playing, so you'll be aware of how bad your internet is throughout the game. So yeah, nothing really special in terms of the co-op in Honkai. Now let's go back to Genshin. In order to play with your friends, you first need to hit Adventure Rank level 16, then exchange each other's UID, or just randomly find someone in the co-op directory and join their game. If people join you, you will become the host, and vice versa. You can set your party privacy to open, which means anyone can join you instantly, request to join, meaning you will get a prompt to accept people if they want to join you, and lastly, closed, which makes it so no one can join your game. This is a very good feature on MiHoYo's end, because the way it works is that, say you're already Adventure Rank 24, and your friend is on Adventure Rank 22. You then proceed to join them, making your friend as the host. Both of you will play the host world progress. What do I mean by that? Let's say your friend has not done a specific task or quest. You can help them do it while you're in their game. Or if you're a random who likes ruining other people's games, do it without them. Please don't. This is where the request to join option really helps. I wasn't recording when this happened, but someone joined my game, and they suddenly started to walk around doing those small puzzles for chests around the map, and honestly, it's pretty annoying. Unless you're planning to play with a friend from start to finish, or just join in if your friend needs a helping hand, this becomes pretty annoying very quickly. I forgot to mention that there is a specific condition, however, in order to play and join a certain person's world, and that is your adventure rank level and world level. Like I've said in part 2, your adventure rank correlates with your world level, so in order to join someone, everyone is needed to be in the same world level, meaning you can't join, or someone else can't join you if you're both on different world levels. Okay, so I've joined my friend, what now? Well, probably one of the first things you're going to realize is which characters you can switch to. Since the co-op only goes up to 4 players at a time, you can't switch and play as all 4 of your deployed characters. For example, if it's only the 2 of you with your friend in the lobby, you'll only be able to play 2 of your deployed characters. And if you don't know, deployed characters mean the 4 characters that you have in your party. Now a quick disclaimer, since I didn't really play co-op that much in the beta, I couldn't really test every feature of the co-op and see everything it brings to the table. And because of that, I didn't know how exactly the game chooses which character we'll be able to use. When I got in my first co-op game, I had Aether, yes, the male traveler's name is Aether and the female traveler is Lumin... Lumine? Lu... yeah. Amber, Lisa, and Kea. When the other person joined, I was only able to use Aether and Kea. You could still choose and switch out the two characters you got, but again, not sure how it really worked when it first gave you the characters. Funny thing really, the footage that I got from episode 12 of my playthrough, I didn't really plan on recording some co-op gameplay. What I did in the episode was I did one of the challenges and, sadly, I didn't know that it would put up a barrier. I know the point of it was not to let me, the one who started the challenge, to escape, but I really did feel bad for the guy just watching me have fun inside the barrier. There's really no real limit as to what you can do together in co-op though. You can freely explore the world, do small mini-games, which I'll talk about a bit later, fight bosses, challenge domains, and so on and so forth. When exploring, you and your co-op friend don't really need to always be together. If, say, you TP first to the city and trigger a loading screen, it won't affect your friend's screen or game at all. In other words, if you're in a loading screen, your friend won't necessarily be in a loading screen too. Well, except if you're doing domains, I would assume. Now let's talk about probably one of the most important things in any multiplayer game, and that is the connection. Will it lag? That is thy question. 
In short, it depends. Of course, not just with your internet, but with your device as well. I guess you can also factor in how the game is too, but you know. Anyway, my first co-op experience was uh, mediocre at best, since again, because it was still the beta and I couldn't even add the person that joined. Fortunately, since the one who joined was on PS4, I can see his PSN ID and add him through PS4, even though I didn't do it. When I was exploring with him and found a chest, it opened normally like it should, but in part 12, I couldn't loot and complete the world quest that I did with him by talking to the NPC. But he was nice enough to message me and say he'll leave so that I can finish and claim the rewards. So yeah, for looting and also talking to NPCs when and shortly after the co-op game was a bit glitchy. Hopefully they do fix and improve this in the full release. Although I do have to say that they did fix adding friends and also I guess the looting at the end of the beta. Now you might be thinking, bro, what about the question? We haven't gotten the answer yet. Well, if you'd let me finish, I was getting to that. You see, near the end of the beta, there was an event called the Elemental Crucible, which was a co-op only event. Before you can take part in it, you need to go into matchmaking. And for the ones who don't understand what that means, in short, you'll be searching for a game and will be waiting for people to join. It took me about 6 minutes to find a game and when people started to join, the game lagged so much to the point where it almost seemed like it froze. And as you guys can see, two of them were seemingly lagging while I was still in the matchmaking screen. Also, after I exited the matchmaking screen, I had to, I guess, go through a loading screen to refresh my game. It makes sense in a way, but I guess there's really no foolproof fix for this since I kinda understand that because someone has joined your game, you need to reload assets and whatnot. With that said, however, I wasn't sure that I was the host of the game and not, say, me joining someone else's world or game. Okay, so a few takeaways from this. One thing I'm not so sure of is if the cause of the lag was because of my internet or the fact that I was playing on the PS4. I specifically say PS4 because everyone that was on the PS4 beta, I mean, you guys can definitely agree with me on this. It was absolutely disappointing. I don't want to say terrible since the most infuriating thing about testing the game on the PS4 was because of the FPS and texture load issues. And if it was because of my internet, then it's kind of weird because the game itself is online only. Whenever it's not co-op, if it is because of my internet, my game has to lag as well regardless. I'm not saying that my internet is good, rather it's sadly the exact opposite, but I feel like because it was still the beta, the netcode wasn't 100% yet. I get that with netcodes it's more common for it to be a topic in fighting games, but you can't really disregard it because most multiplayer games have it as well. I also forgot to mention- Wait, wait, sorry for interrupting. The music's way too epic for this, so uh, give me a sec. Uh, there we go. Alright, carry on. I also forgot to mention, since this game is cross-platform, there's also cross-saving as well. For those who don't know, cross-save means you can play using your account on multiple devices. But this only works for mobile and PC though, meaning say you play the game on PC while you're at home, then you gotta go out for a bit, you can continue where you left off on your mobile device. For PC and Switch users, so far there's no news on cross-saving between consoles and PC or mobile. But yeah, for now I'm just gonna stop there since honestly there are tons of things that I didn't have the chance to test, and also because the more I spend time looking at these VODs for my playthrough, the more it hurts my soul. Although I do have some suggestions for the co-op. Having a co-op only event is good and all, but what about a co-op only domain? Or quest? Maybe even some trading between players? Or even a co-op only puzzle where you need at least a second player to do it or even trigger it? And what about emotes? I mean, all I could do was jump and spin in circles just to get my teammates' attention here. Speaking of emotes though, give me the emote to lay down and sit wherever and not just when there's a spot that has the prompt for it. And also please let me pet the dogs and cats. Please. Also specifically for the PS4 and maybe Switch? Maybe add text chat? The only chat consoles have access to are the messages they normally have, while PC and mobile has text chat. Kinda sad, not gonna lie, but... Yeah, ultimately though, we'll just have to hope and expect a lot of improvements to the co-op and the overall experience of it. With the co-op and Wish now also out of the way, there isn't really any other big topics to talk about. However, there are still tons of other things to keep you wanting to play more and more. For example, cooking, right? I mean, who doesn't like cooking? Probably a lot of people, but hey, you can cook in a video game, and that's pretty fun to do. The ingredients you find around the world, like sweet flowers or apples from trees, will be used in dishes that you can make in the cooking minigame. The way it works is pretty simple. There are various types and rarities to the dishes you can cook, and the higher the rarity, the better the stats and the harder it is to cook it. 
well, I say harder, but I think I've only failed once and it was because I lagged, so. For early game, I suggest you stock up on some eggs from trees near spawn, cause you can make the Teva fried eggs, which can resurrect, or res is what I like to call it for short, your characters when they die. One thing that for some reason wasn't in the game was in the ingredients tab, you can see which items you need in order to make the dishes, right? But why is it that you can't see which dish you can make from them? Like, yeah, I can make bacon with meats and sugar, but what can I make from bacon? If this was implemented, it'll make it easier for players to know which ingredients to prioritize when cooking. Also, you unlock dishes from either unlocking or buying recipes from quests or the restaurants in Mondstadt and Liwei. You can also buy ingredients from Blanche in Mondstadt or Changshun in Liwei. Some ingredients are harder to get than others, so if you do need to make a certain dish and you can't seem to find the materials for it while exploring, meeting those two might be a good idea. Outside of cooking though, collecting flowers to hitting bushes trying to get items from the very start are recommended because even though you could just rush to Mondstadt, having a stock before reaching Adventure Rank 10 is pretty good. Why Adventure Rank 10 you might ask? I don't know, just thought it's a pretty good sort of middle ground as to when you might have the feeling of the game down. Also there's a chest here. There isn't in the footage, but yeah, knowing that there was an early chest here is very useful. Not only that, remember the small cutscene before Paimon talked about the statues? Well, most people would go around towards the right side and not jump down, right? I mean, looking at the VOD now, I realize why because you're supposed to follow Paimon. But yeah, surprisingly enough, there's actually a sea lie spot right under the small cliff you're on. And yeah, sea lies are those floating creatures who will guide you to treasures around it. Just a small tip, if you see the pedestals, I don't know what it's called, but yeah, those things, say three of them around a chest, the pedestals pretty much tells you which way you'd want to go and search for the sea lies. I think there's really not much else you can do in the very beginning part of the game before meeting Amber, but yeah, if they don't change anything in the full release, those tips I just gave might come in very handy. Oh, I almost forgot one thing about cooking. You can get bonuses from certain characters for certain dishes. The bonuses are more to you'd get a bonus dish after making a dish if that makes sense. Not that much of a wow thing, but yeah, this also works with crafting. Some characters will give you bonuses for certain things you craft. One thing that I would craft more than others are the potions, which increases your elemental damage and also weapon ascension materials after hitting world level 1. Okay, let me just wrap up some other suggestions and feedback to not make this video above 20 minutes, and then I'll give my final thoughts on the game because honestly, if I don't, I can see it being 30 minutes. So. Reckon I can do it under 5 minutes? Let's see. Ahem. Chests come in 4 different rarities. Common, Exquisite, Precious, and Luxurious. Common being the, well, most common, and Luxurious being the rarest and you can only get them from certain quests and shrines. Items that drop around the world from enemies won't despawn when you're still playing the same session. Meaning if you don't go back to the title screen or join or host the co-op game, the item will still be there where it first dropped. In certain cases though, like in part 12, I did restart the game and the loot from the chest was still there. When acquiring new items, it will only show how many you got. I suggest making a small animation or anything really to show the total amount you have after getting that certain item. The inventory allows you to see your acquired weapons, artifacts, dishes, books, and so on. But the only two categories that you can sort are the weapons and the artifacts, meaning you can't see and sort your dishes, for example, from 1 star to 4 stars. In order to mine ores quicker, use claymores and not skills. You increase friendship levels by doing random encounters, daily commissions, and quests. Do keep in mind though, random encounters are different from random events. The levels only increase for the deployed characters in your party, meaning characters that aren't deployed won't have their friendship level increase when you complete a task. While you're exploring Teva, occasionally you'll meet with random characters that will ask you for certain items. The good thing is, if say they're asking for a Matsutake, which are the mushrooms, and you still have some in your inventory, you don't need to go out and find some, you can just immediately give them the item. Upgrading weapons and artifacts needs you to wait for the short animation to finally upgrade the item. But luckily for you guys, I found a way to skip that short animation. All you have to do is press or click down to refine, and it'll completely skip the animation, while still getting the upgrade. You're welcome. The game is fully online, meaning if you don't have internet access, you can't play the game. If you get disconnected while gliding and connected back right after, you'll get put back to the high ground where you jumped off and not in the air. Like I said in part 2, stamina is very important. If you find yourself low in stamina while high above ground, try and find a deep enough water because deep waters negate fall damage. And when I say deep, I mean deep enough that you're not just standing up. I also found a trick where, while it's not necessarily an effective way to do it since it burns stamina, but this is the fastest way to sprint. The trick is to tap the sprint twice and not just holding it till you use up your stamina. 
Some NPCs have their own small lore and connections around the world. One simple example is Anna and her brother Anthony, in which they'll spawn it day and night. If you've completed a quest that involves some NPCs, their dialogue changes after completing said quest. A small suggestion, even though not sure how this would work, but since you can only deploy four characters at a time, why not have the ones that aren't be around the city or world and let them wander around? When your character is debuffed with an element, say from a pyro damage, it'll show here on top of your HP. A cool trick is when your animal character is debuffed with pyro, you can mix it instantly with your skill without needing to debuff the enemy with a pyro beforehand. Some characters have skills or ultimates, or I guess their in-game description elemental bursts, that I like to call global. Unlike the traveler's animal skill, global skills will still be active even after you've switched characters. Say, for example, if you have Noel, Xing Qiu, and Xiang Ling, to name a few in your party, you can ultimately do this. Also, I've said this in my playthrough, but debuffs on enemies will show above their heads, and it will flash before it disappears. When you want to forge, or cook, or do anything really, you can see the items that you require, and see the item details including their description and source. This, however, doesn't come into play for the items listed for when you want to ascend your character. The game introduces you to the gliding mechanic, specifically in the quest where you took the gliding exam. One part of the quest shows you that you can rain down bombs while you're gliding. Sadly, this mechanic was only the quest and not implemented permanently as a feature in the game. I notice a small detail like when in part 6 there's a question mark above Amber, but in part 13 there isn't any above Xiangling. Maybe this is quest based, but yeah I just noticed that after looking through the VODs. In certain parts of the world, some chests face incorrectly. This one's not really a game breaking bug, but just know that this type of thing might happen. No 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 oh my god! And finally, here are some glitches that came up a fair few amount of time throughout the beta, or at least what I saw in my own playthrough.
Did I do it? I think I did quite good there, not gonna lie. Probably missed one or two things, but hey, we'll let it slide. Genshin Impact really was something more than what I had expected and anticipated from Mihoyo. Visually, I mean, need I say more? The game is beautiful. The scenery, the art style, the small details like the night sky above you, the feeling that the world gives you, all of it is breathtaking. I find myself always getting distracted with the vibrant colors, the vast open spaces, and the attention to detail. Like whenever you switch characters, you'd have a small animation of their visions element. It makes it more appealing and alive. For the ones who like to try and explore everything and even try to glitch out of the map, they definitely nail it on this one. I've always wanted to explore more in Honkai, specifically the newer maps where there are more details and more spaces that I would like to see, but the game blocks off most of them. It's kinda sad, but at the same time I also understand that the game isn't made for exploration. The amount of freedom to explore in this game is very satisfying. You can climb every building, every mountain, every tree. It makes you curious as to what you'd find at every corner. The sense of finding hidden chests and even just a flower feels very rewarding because it's as if you climb here or jump here, there will always be something waiting for you. Not to mention the puzzles you'd find lying around waiting for you to solve them. Mini games like the gliding exam and the seals scattered around the world, all while being immersed by the beautiful soundtrack that Hoyo Mix has to offer. I mean, come on, listen to this bit here when I arrived at Liyue looking at the sunrise. Ah uh, yes, leeway music. It's actually been a while. Overall, it was a blast playing this game's beta. If anyone at Mihoyo is watching this, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was such a fun experience and I can't wait to see what the full release has to offer. I would also like to thank you guys for the insane amount of support on the feedback videos and I hope you enjoyed and learned a thing or two with this one as well. Alright, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, wait, let me check my notes real quick. Oh, wait, right, I almost forgot. You can also do this in Genshin. Oh yeah! Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. It's been Sage, and I will see you guys on September 28th. Okay! Oh my god! Dude, let me play this game! Who are you today? Yeah, <laughs>